to show you this is a real A, which is going to be side by side with exhibit 360. Okay, so here's where you can see um, some detail. So notice that uh, this would be number 29. You can talk about the number of the tooth. Yeah. yeah, tooth number, number 29. You can see how this is shaped. It uh, starts out here and it gets longer on the right side. This okay. one. Um, hold on, Doctor. I just have to make a record. Just now you're pointing to um, number 29 is fake exhibit 308 um, to the ceiling above uh, 229. Is that right. right? And now you're pointing to fake exhibit 316. Yep. So see how the distal here you know, matches the distal there? And what, what is the distal? I'm sorry. It's the, towards the back of the mouth. So to the to my right. And showing you fake exhibit 318 side by side with 308. Okay, now we'll go to number uh, 19. What did I say that number was? Uh, 29. I'm going to change it to 20. Okay, so it's 20. 29 should be two, 20. Two number 20. Sorry about that. On exhibit 308. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so on 19 here, this is a very unique filling because, number one, it has this little isthmus here. You rarely see that. You can see it here. It's a little hard to see, I bet, from back there, but it's on there. Then the other thing that's unique, you notice how the, this part and this part are real white. So that's metal. It's probably amalgam, silver amalgam. And then this part here is probably com composite resin. Okay, I'm, back here. I'm, just, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're referring to space <coughs> exhibit 318. And your point, you refer to the two teeth that's to the left of the photograph as being white. The, uh, the fillings two fillings on number white. 19. Okay. This is tooth 19. Okay. Then this part is a little more gray, and that's composite resin, because it's not as radio-opaque. On an x-ray, if something's dense and metal, it shows up white. And if it's... Uh, Nothing there, it shows up black. So it's kind of the opposite. But anyway, this is a real interesting filling. It's so unique because it has that little isthmus, which this also has. And then it, someone like patched it with some composite on the back side. So you don't see that very often. Usually a dentist would take this whole thing out and put the whole thing new and either composite, so it would all be composite or all be silver. It wouldn't be two types of material joined together. Okay. And again, you're, you're referring to space exhibit 318. Now, did you notice that composite colored area on um, space exhibit 308, which is the x-ray of Charlie Scott in yeah. your office? Same things here. You see the white is joined by the little isthmus, and then you got the gray part here. And then you again at that time you're referring to space exhibit 308 to uh, is that tooth 19 or 20? Tooth 19. Thank you. And then when you come to tooth 18, which is this smaller, you've got a little silver part here, and you've got the same thing right here. Okay. So again, you're referring to um, tooth 18 on 308. With two eighteen on three, and exhibit three eighteen. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then the last tooth here is number seventeen. It's okay. the wisdom tooth, and it's uh, notice the angle and the root shape are the same. Okay. And again, you refer to the wisdom tooth as shown in space exhibit three zero eight. It is has the same angle as the wisdom tooth. In It's more or less the same. Okay. The same to you. Okay. Space exhibit 320, um, side by side with 308. So this one really shows this little uh, 
lie in between here. And what, what two numbers? That's again number 19. Okay, and you're referring to State's Exhibit 320, is that correct? Yes. We can go ahead. Okay, on State's Exhibit 312, next to State's Exhibit 308. Okay, this is the her right side, which is here. This is the right. Okay, and that's Exhibit 308 to the right side. And this is on the right side. And uh, you notice uh, the wisdom tooth has no filling. That's number 32. Okay. And number thir tooth number 32 in exhibit 308 um, matches up with the same tooth number 32 in exhibit 312. And then uh, 31, it has this filling where it's on the front on the front side or my right side, it drops down and then it's higher up through the center. Just like this one. Through the center, it's higher, and it drops down here. Okay, and just for the record, the first um, thing you mentioned in space exhibit 312 pointed or indicated to the middle tooth that's shown in that photograph. It's number 31. And tooth number 31. Are you saying that filling matches up with the uh, two matches up with thirty one on exhibit three zero eight? Right. Okay. And then if you go to the next tooth, which is number thirty, you see it has the part that goes lower on the back side, and then it kind of zigzags here, goes into the middle. And you look at this one, it does the same thing. Longer on the back, zigzags along, and then a little thicker up right there. Okay. And you just referred to um, number, exhibit number 30 on 30. exhibit 312. And 312. And, and two number 30 in state exhibit 308. Correct. Let's see what's next. Okay. And show me state exhibit 313. One thing that's Interesting here is this tooth is cracked. Probably whatever was happening, it ended up getting cracked there. So this one has no crack. Okay, so you're referring to state exhibit 313. Number 30. You notice it cracked in tooth number 30. It's the mesial root of number 30. And that crack is not shown in the uh, x ray that you took of Carby Scott. States Exhibit 308. Correct. Motion States Exhibit 314. Oh, that's 314. 315. I'm sorry. Um, oh. Where were we one back a minute ago? Okay, we go back to 314. So here, I'll just point out that there's no fillings. And these two bicuspids, that's teeth numbers 29 and 28. And state exhibit 308. And there's no fillings here in 29 28. And that's a state exhibit 314. Mm -hmm. Read for the next photo. Yeah. State exhibit 315. Mm, this is a super remarkable, but uh, the only thing I'd point out is, you see these two are overlapping. This is 27 and 26. They have a little overlap. Okay. And that's in State's Exhibit 315. And you can see the same overlap here. And you're pointing to the uh, middle of the bottom jaw in State's Exhibit, or bottom teeth in State's Exhibit 308. 27, 26. So when they overlap, it's twice as thick and it gets a little wider whiter instead of grayer. And lastly, is it 317? What so what I'm saying there is that this has the same crooked overlapping as this one does. So that's another way I idea. Okay, next. And last one is us. Take it 317. Um, so this is on the other side. This is 22 and 21. And again, the overlapping. Let me see. Yeah, right here. So 
is it 21, 22? You see the overlapping there where it's a little wider? And you see it here. So again, the teeth are a little crooked, overlapping. Same thing. So there's, I've identified about 10 things that match. So that's how you identify it. It's very unlikely another person's jaw would have all 10 of those things. If I were to show you a, a picture of, of the job, would you be able to replace it? You mean a photograph? Right. Would I be able to identify that? Right. Probably, because I can see, uh, you can't see down into the tooth, but you can see the fillings on top, on the chewing surface, mm -hmm. and you can see the crooked teeth. I don't have a top view at this point, but let me let me just show you state. Um, um, you know, I just have permission to publish state's exhibit two two thirty three, which is the end. Permission, permission. And you can just stay there, and I'm going to show you and just um, look at the monitor of state's exhibit. I'm showing you what's already in evidence of state's exhibit. 233. Do, do you recognize that? Well, it looks like the jaw that they brought in from the x ray. And I'm going to show you space exhibit 235. Yeah, it looks like the other half. But uh, I'd have to really get closer to it to definitely say that. Because I can't see the fillings, okay. you know, from the side. So from this vantage point, it'd be hard for you to tell. Yeah, it's a little hard to tell. Thank you so much. I will, uh, there, there will be no uh, further questions. You are excused. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rivera. Um, yeah, I think we will next be calling Dr. Uh, Detective Nelson Hamilton. And um, he's getting, getting called. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now uh, return to uh, Detective Hamilton who was uh, previously called uh, as a witness and remains under oath.
place under oath. Do you understand that you are still under oath? Yes. Thank you. You may continue with your examination. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, yesterday, I think where we left off, um, I believe you had just finished testifying about uh, on Thursday morning going to be out of your child's area with another officer. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And I think you finished that testimony by saying or stating that um, after not finding a recovery anything that morning, you returned back to the office. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, did you receive any assignment um, with respect to the missing person case involving Travis Scott the following day? And this is the uh, Friday, February 14, 2014. I did. Because I received a call uh, that uh, evening from the former lieutenant, Peter DeLima, that they were going to conduct a search uh, in the k area. And they wanted me to come out that morning to assist with the search. So was this Friday morning or Saturday? I'm sorry, that was the morning of uh, the 15th, Saturday. Okay. So you didn't, you didn't do any searching on um, Friday, February 14th? No, I didn't. Okay. What, if anything, were you doing um, at that time on that day? On the 14th, I was probably in the office working on reports. And turning your attention then to the following day, Saturday, February 15th of 2014, Uh, we met at the Wailuku Police Station, uh, myself, and then there were several other detectives there, uh, members of the Special Response Team and the Crime Reduction Unit. And what was what was the uh, plan for that one? That we were going to drive out to uh, out towards Kanai, and then there were a certain area uh, known as Paraquats or New Ailua Bay. And um, I think I might have asked you this uh, yesterday, and this is where we might have um, how were you? How were you dressed at that time? Um, I was wearing black boots. Um, I had a pair of uh, uh, blue BDU pants or battle dress uniform. It's a military style with the uh, cargo pockets on it. And I think I had a black sweatshirt on. And um, approximately what time, if you recall, did you both arrive there at the Noai Lua or Paraquats? It was uh, shortly before 9 a.m. And uh, do you recall what transpired? When when we got there, uh, the special response team set up grids to search, and then uh, after the grids were set up, uh, we were assigned an individual grid uh, to search. And when you say grid, can you briefly describe what you mean by that? There's a crime scene tape laid out in squares adjacent to each other within an area, and there were several, several different squares uh, that were set up uh, to search. And um, what if anything, or what if anything in particular were you assigned to do that morning? Approximately, uh, the area that we searched was um, probably about 175 feet uh, from the dirt road off of Hana Highway that leads down to New Ailua Bay. Uh, you come down the road about 100 feet, and then we were in the bush probably about 175 feet in there. And there was a trail that uh, went through the brush area, and we searched an area just the Malka side or the, the um, south side of that trail, about a 10 by 10 square area. Now, um, with respect to arriving at this trail that you're, you're mm -hmm. describing, uh, was this from the paved highway or from the uh, dirt road? It was a dirt road that was off the paved highway. And, and what if any landmark was there uh, for you that, that you noticed? There, there was a bridge right before. And once you got to the dirt road, um, going into the woodland area, was there anything you noticed um, prior to the woodland area? As uh, a marker of sorts? Uh, off the, I don't remember. And was there a refrigerator or anything? There was a refrigerator on, off the dirt road, yes. And is that where you would have entered? To yes. To the area you just described? Yes, that was the area that we were uh, informed would be the trail in. And um, specifically, do you recall how far down you went into that trail? About 175 feet or so. And um, can you, you mentioned that a grid was already set up by the special response team, is that correct? 
Yes, they set it up before we started searching. Uh, was it set up before you got there or when you got there? I think it was set up when we got there. It, it was set up before we started searching. And is there a particular area that you recall that you went within the grid that was um, made by the special response team? Uh, it was on the south side of the trail and it was uh, kind of in the middle of the grid, the grid areas that were set up. And can you describe how you went about conducting your search in that grid area? Uh, myself and one of the special response team officers uh, did a, a search of that area. We just, uh, on the, we looked on the ground and then moved from one end to the, uh, from the north end of the uh, grid to the south and then back until we covered the entire area. And when you say the north end of the grid, um, are you closer to the dirt road that you entered? Correct. The, the north end would be towards the dirt road, and the south end would be towards the river. And um, if you could... I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. Uh, the east side would be towards the road, and the west side would be towards the river. Then south would be towards the mountain, and the north would be towards the ocean. Okay, so you're, so you're starting from the east end east, to correct. the west. That's correct. And west, uh, what direction is, um, is that the hiking direction? Yes. And if you could describe for us the manner of how you conducted your search, I, I, be specific if you can. Uh, we walked, um, at that point we were walking upright, looking down at the ground. I mean, there wasn't a lot of, uh, the, the, the foliage was kind of short in the area that we searched, so there wasn't a lot of um, obstructions at the ground. You know, we moved leaves here and there, but for the most part we just walked and looked at the ground. Um, at any time did you uh, get closer to the ground other than just by walking? Uh, not in that grid. Um, and did you, what, what would you do as, as you cleared the grid? Was, was there anything that you would do? Um, after we had cleared that grid, we got out of the, uh, the, the marked area and then back on the trail and at that point, we were waiting for everyone else to finish searching their grids and then to be reassigned to the next area to search. Okay. So is this, grid, um, is this grid more towards the east that, that, you, that you're talking about at this point? Yes, it was closer to the road. And um, can, can you tell us just, just on what happened as you went further west? After we cleared that area, there was, a, um, after we cleared our grid, there was an area about 10 feet to the west of where we had searched. And then I had noticed that there was a, uh, a mass of maggots on the ground, probably thousands of them uh, would be my estimation, moving in a circular formation. So I walked over closer to them to get a better look uh, to kind of see what was going on in that area. And as I got closer, um, I noticed that the stench there was, a, there was a slight stench, but it got stronger as you got closer to that spot right on the ground where the maggots were. And now, Detective, can you describe the stench that you just mentioned? It smelled like uh, decomposing humans. And what did you do at that point? Uh, at that point, I just kind of watched, you know, seeing what the maggots were doing. And they were moving kind of in a circular formation clockwise. And I got down on the ground to get a closer look at the maggots. And then at that point, I noticed a shiny, uh, like, silver-colored metal ball. And can, can you describe when you said you got down on the ground? Can you tell us what you mean by that? I squatted down about as low as I can go. I, I didn't get on my hands and knees at that point. I just got down, like, squatted. And then as I looked up, I noticed the shiny uh, metal ball kind of in the dirt under a leaf. And when you noticed, what, if anything, did you do at that point? At that point, I took a stick and kind of lifted up the leaf to take a look at what it was. And then I noticed that it was uh, two metal balls with a metal uh, rod in the middle, kind of uh, body piercing. Um, what, if anything, did you notice about the body piercing? Um, at that point, I called, uh, I, I notified our supervisor that there was something there, and then at that point, evidence specialist Anthony Earls came down, and uh, we had him photograph the area before we moved anything, and then as soon as uh, it was photographed, uh, he recovered the, um, the piercing, or the, the body piercing, 
and I noticed that there was some kind of like biological material or what appeared to be that still on the on the bar. When you say biological material, what do you mean by that? It looked like a chunk of skin. Did you continue searching in that area? Yes, I did. I guess that day. Can you describe what you what your continued search um, involved? From that point, after the the piercing was uh, recovered, I started moving towards the the south. Kind of went up on the, the area was in uh, there's an indentation, and the area where the piercing was found was in a higher uh, point, and then the bottom of the indentation kind of sloped from east to west from the road towards the river. So if there's an indentation, it kind of slanted like that. And then so I started at the top point, at the highest point where the piercing was, and started moving towards the south, towards the mountains. At that point, I got down on my hands and knees, and I was crawling uh, through the, I guess, the massive maggots that were on the ground, and started working up towards the hill, uh, knowing that we're looking for smaller items at that point. That's when I noticed uh, what appeared to be a fingernail with some skin attached to it. Um, and the fingernail with some skin attached to it, um, can you tell us what was it resting on anything? Or in, in it was just laying on the ground. And did, what, if anything, did you do with that? Because we notified uh, Anthony Earls, who was marked photographed and recovered. Now, getting back to the body piercing, did you handle to touch that at all? No, I didn't. And with respect to the fingernail that you saw a little ways down with skin attached, did you handle the touch that at all? No, I didn't. And is there a reason why you did not handle the touch any of those items? It was uh, uh, to avoid contamination and moving it for uh, uh, before it was photographed. Um, did you continue searching? Yes, I did. Can you tell us what happened? Uh, from that point, I started moving west towards the river and uh, as I moved down, I found three more spots uh, where there appeared to be skin, and then another fingernail, probably about a foot to the south of where uh, the first fingernail was found. And then from there, I continued down and found three more fingernails, uh, kind of in a line heading from east, I'm sorry, from east to west, and the, the, I'm sorry, the skin and the fingernail was to the west of the first fingernail that I found. Everything was moving from east to west. Now, the, these subsequent items that you just described that you found, did you handle or touch them? In <clears throat> no, I didn't. And um, what if anything did you see happen to <coughs> those items? Those items were photographed, they were marked and then photographed and then uh, recovered by evidence specialist Anthony Earls. Continue your search after that. Okay. After that, we continued searching that area for uh, more um, items, and I, I believe another uh, what appeared to be bone fragment was recovered from that same general area. So, um, did you did you did you yourself find that bone fragment? No, or I did didn't. You just observe it. I just observed. You know, just for the record, I'm showing the council what has been marked in space exhibits 151 and 152 for identification. <coughs> there may approach um, Detective Hamilton with these exhibits. You may. You know, Detective Hamilton, I'm showing you what has been marked for identification. This Exhibits 151 and 152. Okay. Did you recognize what's depicted in both of those photographs? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Do they accurately? Well, let me ask you a question. What is it? In 151, that is the area where the piercing and the fingernails and the skin and the bone fragment were found. And Stacy's exhibit 152 is the piercing. Do, do those photographs actually depict the area that you just described uh, back on February 15th of 2014? Yes, it does. Have they been changed or altered in any way? No. 
Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to examine the state's exhibits 151 and 152, which have the marked identification. Yes, sir. No objection. State's exhibits 151 and 152, marked for identification purposes, are received in evidence. And, Your Honor, at this time, the state would ask permission to publish state's exhibits 138, This is the area where the uh, piercing and finger, uh, fingernails and the skin and the uh, bone fragments are found. Okay, and in this area, from, from this vantage point, can you see the uh, body piercing that you described earlier? No, I can't. Okay, show me the state's exhibit 152. Okay, state's exhibit 152. Yes, I can see the piercing. Okay, and can you point that out on the state's exhibit 152? It's right there. And the record should reflect that you are pointing to what appears to be like a silver ball with um, a rod attached to it right in the middle of the photograph. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And State's Exhibit 138. That's the piercing here. That's one end. That's the other end. Okay. Now the right in the middle. Okay. And again, you're pointing to the middle of the photograph. You mentioned earlier that there was a leaf that was over it, and you, you removed the leaf. Is that right? Yeah, if you go back to, uh, I think it was the first picture of the piercing, you can kind of see the leaf on it. Okay, so I'm um, going back to State's Exhibit 152. Yeah, the leaf is right here. Okay, and again, you're pointing to, um, you're indicating to right toward the middle portion of the photograph. Right? Correct, just so below the piercing. silver ball. And now showing you State's Exhibit 138. This was after uh, everything was uh, located. These are all the, the spots where things were uh, found. Okay. Now, there are there are letters um, that appear to be on, on, on yellow markers. Do you see that there? Yes. Okay. Did you see who placed that there? That would have been evidence specialist uh, Anthony Earls. Okay. You saw that yourself? Yes. And is, are, are these the spots or areas where um, you had found the items that you just mentioned, for example, the skin as well as the fingernails? Yes, everything but the bone fragment, which is marked by Jay. And turning your attention to State's Exhibit 139. Is that the picture there? The, um, figure yes, it is. Okay, can you just point to it? Right here. And the record shows that you're pointing to a fingernail that's in the middle of the photograph. So you state that there's one photo. Right here is more skin. And 
this case exhibit 145. And that's more skin right here. This case exhibit, I'm going to show you case exhibit 143 again. Okay, looking at that diagram, are you able to point out using the, uh, the lettering markers there, are you able to point out where the fingernails that you described that you found were located? Yes. And can you just do it one by one for us, please? Right here would be the piercing. Okay, so what letter are you referring I'm to? Referring to A, and this would be from the easterly direction, and then everything was found from A to K, running east to west. Okay. And so this A would be where the body piercing was found. B was where the first fingernail and uh, some skin was found. And C, uh, D, and F are where uh, skin, segments of skin were found there. And then E, G, H, and I were where the fingernails were found. And then you mentioned earlier you didn't find the um, the bone fragment in J, but you did observe that. Is that correct? That is correct. And then I'm not uh, K. I believe was a reference to something else. It was, there, there was no item found at K. There was no item found at K that day on Saturday. Yeah, that's correct. <coughs> Um, now, Detective, did you um, ever come to contact with um, a Stephen couple? Yes, I did. And when was the first time that occurred? February 27th, uh, 2014. Now, if you were to see that person again, would you be able to recognize him? Yes, I would. If he's here in this court, would you please point to him and describe the color of his shirt? He's sitting right here, and he's wearing blue and light-colored Aloha shirt. Uh, you know, the record should reflect that Detective Hamilton has identified him. The record will so reflect. Thank you. Now, um, Detective, was there a time um, when, or did you ever go to the defendant's residence? Yes, I did. And what was the purpose? I was assisting uh, Detective Wendelou at that time to do a, a search of his room. And as far, um, I'm not sure if I asked you this yesterday, but when you first became involved in or been assigned to assist in the case um, involving Charlie Scott, do you know who the primary or the lead detective was at that time? Yes, it was uh, Detective Wendelou. And. When you conducted, um, when you assisted Detective Lou in conducting the search of uh, the defendant's residence, was there any particular area then that you searched? I searched his bedroom. Yes, he was on the property. Um, was there any other officers or detectives there to assist? Yes, there were. There was a couple officers from the crime reduction unit and a couple officers from the uh, special response team. Now, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, what, if any, other assignment other than, than the search did you have with respect to this case involving Charlie Scott? Uh, prior, prior to the search? Um, I 
Yes, yes, prior to the uh, February 27th meeting. Uh, I was assigned to assist uh, uh, to get statements from uh, witnesses, track down witnesses, and, uh, and people with information, uh, obtain statements from them. And did you prepare a, a uh, police report um, with respect to that assignment? Yes, I did. And can you tell us approximately how many individuals you would have interviewed uh, with respect to that assignment of getting statements and information regarding this case? Uh, between 30 and 40 people. And did you conduct um, any of those interviews with uh, Detective Lee President? No, I didn't. When you conducted those interviews, um, was there anyone in particular that you have conducted those interviews? Yes, there was. And do you recall who those persons were with? Uh, Captain Richard Dodge was the one I mostly do my interviews with. Um, and pursuant to your investigation, uh, Detective, did you, I guess, make contact with persons that you may have been interested in with respect to this case? Yes, I did. And when I say persons uh, you would have been interested in, um, can you explain that? Possible suspects or other persons of interest uh, uh, in regards to uh, Carly's disappearance. And um, how many persons, possible suspects or persons of interest uh, were this be? Ten. And as you sit there right now, can you, do you recall who these persons are or persons? people of interest or possible suspects were? Yes, I do. And, and can you uh, name them for us at this time? There was Alfred, uh, Alfred Franco, Alton Franco, Derek Franco, Matt McCormick, Taylor Farner, Tyson Kyris, Mario Capobianco Puck, uh, Joshua Hyman, uh, John Pipkin, Are you familiar with a person by the name of Devin Fulcher? Yes, and Devin Fulcher. Now, what was um, what was your intention of oh, speaking with these persons? Uh, to find out if they had anything to do with this with this case. And um, did you have an opportunity to speak with each other person that you just named? Yes, I did. And you said your purpose was to see if they had anything to do with this case. Um, when you spoke with them, what, can, can you just briefly tell us what, what that consists of? Uh, we did. Uh, I'm not asking for the content of their. Uh, or the based on that representation, I will overrule the objection. So, uh, what, what would this consist of? Uh, we conducted interviews, and uh, if the interviews required, uh, if things were said that piqued their interest, we'd for, look further into statement by other means. Now, all of these uh, the persons you had, you had just named, the uh, 10 persons, um, after you had conducted your interviews with them, uh, were they still persons of interest or suspects? It relies on hearsay and it calls for the objection. With respect to Alfred Franco, what if anything, um, after you interviewed, interviewed uh, I'm sorry, Alfred Franco, after you interviewed him, what if anything transpired after that? We deemed he was no longer a suspect. Yeah, relies on hearsay. Objection is sustained. Motion to strike the answer. The motion to strike is granted. Now, Detective, without telling us what your conclusion, what you deem, I'm just asking what if any other action was taken. No. And after you spoke with Elton Franco, or, in, or did you did you book any interview Elton Franco as well? Yes. And was this you and Captain Dodds? Yes. And after you had interviewed Elton Franco, what if any um, action was taken? No. With respect to Derek Franco, um, did you interview him as well? 
did. And after he was in, did you, uh, what have been the actions taken? No. Now, some of these persons, uh, beginner Alfred Franco, um, was there more? Was there anything other than an interview? No, there wasn't. And with respect to Alfred Franco? No, there's nothing. And Derek Franco? Nothing else. Now, with respect to Matthew McCormick, um, did you interview him as well? Yes, I did. And after you interviewed him, or who, do you recall who you were with when you interviewed him? Uh, Captain Dodds. And after you interviewed um, Mr. McCormick, what if any action was taken? No. I don't check that's the relevance if there's no action taken. Yeah, this goes for his investigation. That goes for to hearsay then. That's based on hearsay. The objection is sustained. Move to strike all of those answers that were based on that question. No, we didn't. And after speaking with Alfred Franco, objection. the objection is sustained. The judge is whether they did anything else, not, I'm not asking for a conclusion. I'm just asking whether they did I understand. Um, uh, the court will, uh, the court's ruling will stand. Move to strike. The motion to strike is granted. And did you both speak with Mario Kapovian Bambak? Yes, we did. How about Tyson Ferris? Yes, we did. And then unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask you. Now, going through the names of the names. Uh, I will overrule the objection. And Taylor Farner as well? Yes. How about Joshua Hyman? Yes. And John Kipley? Yes.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're at that point where we're going to be adjourning for the day, so I, I thank you so much for your uh, cooperation and service today. We will look forward to seeing you on Friday, September 9th at 9 a.m. And uh, please keep in mind my cautionary instructions that remain in effect, and, and I won't repeat them again, uh, at least today. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for your service, and have a nice evening, and we'll look forward to seeing you on Friday. Thank you. We are adjourned.